Chapter Fourteen, Part One of the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, by Charles Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michael Armenta. Chapter Fourteen: Mutual Affinities of Organic Beings, Morphology, Embryology, Rudimentary Organs, Classification groups subordinate to groups natural system rules and difficulties in classification explained on the theory of descent with modification classification of varieties descent always used in classification analogical or adaptive characters affinities general complex and radiating extinction separates and defines groups morphology between members of the same class, between parts of the same individual. Embryology, laws of, explained by variations, not supervening at an early age, and being inherited at a corresponding age. Rudimentary organs, their origin explained. Summary. Classification. From the most remote period in the history of the world, organic beings have been found to resemble each other in descending degrees, so that they can be classed in groups under groups. This classification is not arbitrary, like the grouping of the stars in constellations. The existence of groups would have been of simple significance if one group had been exclusively fitted to inhabit the land, and another the water, one to feed on flesh, another on vegetable matter, and so on. But the case is widely different, for it is notorious how commonly members of even the same subgroup have different habits. In the second and fourth chapters on variation and on natural selection, I have attempted to show that within each country it is the widely ranging, the much diffused and common, that is, the dominant species, belonging to the larger genera in each class, which vary most. The varieties or incipient species thus produced ultimately become converted into new and distinct species and these on the principle of inheritance tend to produce other new and dominant species consequently the groups which are now large and which generally include many dominant species tend to go on increasing in size I further attempted to show that from the varying descendants of each species trying to occupy as many and as different places as possible in the economy of nature, they constantly tend to diverge in character. This latter conclusion is supported by observing the great diversity of forms which, in any small area, come into the closest competition, and by certain facts in naturalization. I attempted also to show that there is a steady tendency in the forms which are increasing in number and diverging in character to supplant and exterminate the preceding less divergent and less improved forms. I request the reader to turn to the diagram illustrating the action, as formerly explained, of these several principles, and he will see that the inevitable result is that the modified descendants proceeding from one progenitor become broken up into groups subordinate to groups. In the diagram, each letter on the uppermost line may represent a genus, including several species, and the whole of the genera along this upper line form together one class, for all are descended from one ancient parent, and consequently have inherited something in common. But the three genera on the left hand have, on this same principle, much in common, and form a sub-family distinct from that containing the next two genera on the right hand, which diverged from a common parent at the fifth stage of descent. These five genera have also much in common, though less than when grouped in sub-families, and they form a family distinct from that containing the three genera still further to the right hand, which diverged at an earlier period, and all these genera descended from a form an order instinct from the genera descended from i so that we here have many species descended from a single progenitor grouped into genera and the genera into subfamilies families and orders all under one great class the grand fact of the natural subordination of organic beings in groups under groups which from its familiarity does not always sufficiently strike us 
is in my judgment thus explained no doubt organic beings like all other objects can be classed in many ways either artificially by single characters or more naturally by a number of characters we know for instance that minerals and the elemental substances can be thus arranged in this case there is of course no relation to genealogical succession and no cause can at present be assigned for their falling into groups but with organic beings the case is different and the view above given accords with their natural arrangement in group under group and no other explanation has ever been attempted naturalists as we have seen try to arrange the species genera and families in each class on what is called the natural system but what is meant by this system some authors look at it merely as a scheme for arranging together those living objects which are most alike and for separating those which are most unlike or as an artificial method of enunciating as briefly as possible general propositions that is by one sentence to give the characters common for instance to all mammals by another those common to all carnivora by another those common to the dog genus and then by adding a single sentence a full description is given of each kind of dog the ingenuity and utility of this system are indisputable but many naturalists think that something more is meant by the natural system they believe that it reveals the plan of the creator but unless it be specified whether order in time or space or both or what else is meant by the plan of the creator it seems to me that nothing is thus added to our knowledge expressions such as that famous one by linnaeus which we often meet with in a more or less concealed form namely that the characters do not make the genus but that the genus gives the characters seems to imply that some deeper bond is included in our classifications than mere resemblance i believe that this is the case and that community of descent the one known cause of close similarity in organic beings is the bond which though observed by various degrees of modification is partially revealed to us by our classifications let us now consider the rules followed in classification and the difficulties which are encountered on the view that classification either gives some unknown plan of creation or is simply a scheme for enunciating general propositions and of placing together the forms most like each other it might have been thought and was in ancient times thought that those parts of the structure which determined the habits of life and the general place of each being in the economy of nature would be of very high importance in classification nothing could be more false no one regards the external similarity of a mouse to a shrew of a dugong to a whale or of a whale to a fish as of any importance these resemblances though so intimately connected with the whole life of the being are ranked as merely quote, adaptive or analogical characters end quote but to the consideration of these resemblances we shall recur it may even be given as a general rule that the less any part of the organization is concerned with special habits the more important it becomes for classification as an instance owen in speaking of the dugong says quote, the generative organs being those which are most remotely related to the habits and food of an animal i have always regarded as affording very clear indications of its true affinities we are at least likely in the modifications of these organs to mistake a merely adaptive for an essential character End quote. with plants how remarkable it is that the organs of vegetation on which their nutrition and life depend are of little signification whereas the organs of reproduction with their product the seed and embryo are of paramount importance so again in formerly discussing certain morphological characters which are not functionally important we have seen that they are often of the highest service in classification this depends on their constancy throughout many allied groups and their constancy chiefly depends on any slight deviations not having been preserved and accumulated by natural selection which acts only on serviceable characters 
that the mere physiological importance of an organ does not determine its classificatory value is almost proved by the fact that in allied groups in which the same organ as we have every reason to suppose has nearly the same physiological value its classificatory value is widely different no naturalist can have worked at any group without being struck with this fact and it has been fully acknowledged in the writings of almost every author it will suffice to quote the highest authority robert brown who in speaking of certain organs in the proteaceae says their generic importance quote, like that of all their parts not only in this but as i apprehend in every natural family is very unequal and in some cases seems to be entirely lost end quote. again in another work he says the genera of the canarasi differ in having one or more ovaria in the existence or absence of albumen in the imbricate or valvular estivation any one of these characters singly is frequently of more than generic importance though here even when all taken together they appear insufficient to separate nestis from conarus to give an example among insects in one great division of the hymenoptera the antenna as westwood has remarked are most constant in structure in another division they differ much and the divisions are of quite subordinate value in classification yet no one will say that the antenna in these two divisions of the same order are of unequal physiological importance any number of instances could be given of the varying importance for classification of the same important organ within the same group of beings again no one will say that rudimentary or atrophied organs are of high physiological or vital importance yet undoubtedly organs in this condition are often of much value in classification no one will dispute that the rudimentary teeth in the upper jaws of young ruminants and certain rudimentary bones of the leg are highly serviceable in exhibiting the close affinity between ruminants and pachyderms robert brown has strongly insisted on the fact that the position of the rudimentary florets is of the highest importance in the classification of the grasses numerous instances could be given of characters derived from parts which must be considered of very trifling physiological importance but which are universally admitted as highly serviceable in the definition of whole groups for instance whether or not there is an open passage from the nostrils to the mouth the only character according to owen which absolutely distinguishes fish and reptiles the inflection of the angle of the lower jaw in marsupials the manner in which the wings of insects are folded mere colour in certain algae mere pubescence on part of the flower in grasses the nature of the dermal covering as hair or feathers in the vertebrata if the ornithorhynchus had been covered with feathers instead of hair this external and trifling character would have been considered by naturalists as an important aid in determining the degree of affinity of this strange creature to birds the importance for classification of trifling characters mainly depends on their being correlated with many other characters of more or less importance the value indeed of an aggregate of characters is very evident in natural history hence as has often been remarked a species may depart from its allies in several characters both of high physiological importance and of almost universal prevalence and yet leave us in no doubt where it should be ranked hence also it has been found that a classification founded on any single character however important that may be has always failed for no part of the organization is invariably constant the importance of an aggregate of characters even when none are important alone explains the aphorism enunciated by linnaeus namely that the characters do not give the genus but the genus gives the character for this seems founded on the appreciation of many trifling points of resemblance too slight to be defined certain plants belonging to the malpiacy bear perfect and degraded flowers in the latter as a d Usso has remarked quote, the greater number of the characters proper to the species to the genus to the family to the class disappear and thus laugh at our classification end quote when aspicarpa produced in france during several years 
only these degraded flowers, departing so wonderfully in a number of the most important points of structure from the proper type of the order, yet M. Richard sagaciously saw, as you so observes, that this genus should still be retained among the Malpiphiaceae. This case well illustrates the spirit of our classifications. Practically, when naturalists are at work, they do not trouble themselves about the physiological value of the characters which they use in defining a group or in allocating any particular species. If they find a character nearly uniform and common to a great number of forms, and not common to others, they use it as one of high value. If common to some lesser number, they use it as of subordinate value. This principle has been broadly confessed by some naturalists to be the true one, and by none more clearly than by that excellent botanist, Auguste St. Hilaire. If several trifling characters are always found in combination, though no apparent bond of connection can be discovered between them, a special value is set on them. As in most groups of animals, important organs such as those for propelling the blood or for aerating it or those for propagating the race are found nearly uniform they are considered as highly serviceable in classification but in some groups all these the most important vital organs are found to offer characters of quite subordinate value thus as fritz muller has lately remarked in the same group of crustaceans cypridina is furnished with a heart while in two closely allied genera, namely Cypris and Cytheria, there is no such organ. One species of Cypridina has well-developed bronchi, while another species is destitute of them. We can see why characters derived from the embryo should be of equal importance with those derived from the adult, for a natural classification, of course, includes all ages, but it is by no means obvious, on the ordinary view, why the structure of the embryo should be more important for this purpose than that of the adult, which alone plays its full part in the economy of nature. Yet it has been strongly urged by those great naturalists, Milne, Edwards, and Agassi, that embryological characters are the most important of all, and this doctrine has very generally been admitted as true. Nevertheless, their importance has sometimes been exaggerated, owing to the adaptive characters of larvae not having been excluded. In order to show this, Fritz Müller arranged, by the aid of such characters alone, the great class of crustaceans, and the arrangement did not prove a natural one. But there can be no doubt that embryonic, excluding larval characters, are of the highest value for classification, not only with animals, but with plants. Thus the main divisions of flowering plants are founded on differences in the embryo, on the number and position of the cotyledons, and on the mode of development of the plumule and radicile. We shall immediately see why these characters possess so high a value in classification, namely, from the natural system being genealogical in its arrangement. Our classifications are often plainly influenced by chains of affinities, Nothing can be easier than to define a number of characters common to all birds, but with crustaceans any such definition has hitherto been found impossible. There are crustaceans at the opposite ends of the series which have hardly a character in common. Yet the species at both ends, from being plainly allied to others, and these to others, and so onwards, can be recognized as unequivocally belonging to this, and to no other class of the articulata. Geographical distribution has often been used, though perhaps not quite logically, in classification, more especially in very large groups of closely allied forms. Temenik insists on the utility, or even necessity, of this practice in certain groups of birds, and it has been followed by several entomologists and botanists. Finally, with respect to the comparative value of the various groups of species, such as orders, suborders, families, subfamilies and genera they seem to be at least at present almost arbitrary several of the best botanists such as mr bentham and others have strongly insisted on their arbitrary value instances could be given among plants and insects of a group first ranked by practised naturalists as only a genus 
and then raised to the rank of a subfamily or family and this has been done not because further research has detected important structural differences at first overlooked but because numerous allied species with slightly different grades of difference have been subsequently discovered all the foregoing rules and aids and difficulties in classification may be explained if i do not greatly deceive myself on the view that the natural system is founded on descent with modification that the characters which naturalists consider as showing true affinity between any two or more species are those which have been inherited from a common parent all true classification being genealogical that community of descent is the hidden bond which naturalists have been unconsciously seeking and not some unknown plan of creation or the enunciation of general propositions and the mere putting together and separating objects more or less alike but i must explain my meaning more fully i believe that the arrangement of the groups within each class in due subordination and relation to each other must be strictly genealogical in order to be natural but that the amount of difference in the several branches or groups though allied in the same degree in blood to their common progenitor may differ greatly being due to the different degrees of modification which they have undergone and this is expressed by the forms being ranked under different genera families sections or orders the reader will best understand what is meant if he will take the trouble to refer to the diagram in the fourth chapter we will suppose the letters a to l to represent allied genera existing during the silurian epoch and descended from some still earlier form in three of these genera a f and i a species has transmitted modified descendants to the present day represented by the fifteen genera a fourteen to z fourteen on the uppermost horizontal line now all these modified descendants from a single species are related in blood or descent in the same degree they may metaphorically be called cousins to the same millionth degree yet they differ widely and in different degrees from each other the forms descended from a now broken up into two or three families constitute a distinct order from those descended from i also broken up into two families nor can the existing species descended from a be ranked in the same genus with the parent a or from those from i with parent i but the existing genus f fourteen may be supposed to have been but slightly modified and it will then rank with the parent genus f just as some few still living organisms belong to the silurian genera so that the comparative value of the differences between these organic beings which are all related to each other in the same degree in blood has come to be widely different nevertheless their genealogical arrangement remains strictly true not only at the present time but at each successive period of descent all the modified descendants from a will have inherited something in common from their common parent as will all the descendants from i so will it be with each subordinate branch of descendants at each successive stage if however we suppose any descendant of a or of i to have become so much modified as to have lost all traces of its parentage in this case its place in the natural system will be lost as seems to have occurred with some few existing organisms all of the descendants of the genus f along its whole line of descent are supposed to have been but little modified and they form a single genus but this genus though much isolated will still occupy its proper intermediate position the representation of the groups as here given in the diagram on a flat surface is much too simple the branches ought to have diverged in all directions if the names of the groups had been simply written down on a linear series the representation would have been still less natural and it is notoriously not possible to represent in a series on a flat surface the affinities which we discover in nature among the beings of the same group thus the natural system is genealogical in its arrangement like a pedigree 
but the amount of modification which the different groups have undergone has to be expressed by ranking them under different so-called genera subfamilies families sections orders and classes it may be worth while to illustrate this view of classification by taking the case of languages if we possessed a perfect pedigree of mankind a genealogical arrangement of the races of man would afford the best classification of the various languages now spoken throughout the world and if all extinct languages and all intermediate and slowly changing dialects were to be included such an arrangement would be the only possible one yet it might be that some ancient languages had altered very little and had given rise to few new languages whilst others had altered much owing to the spreading isolation and state of civilization of the several co-descended races and had thus given rise to many new dialects and languages the various degrees of difference between the languages of the same stock would have to be expressed by groups subordinate to groups but the proper or even the most possible arrangement would still be genealogical and this would be strictly natural as it would connect together all languages extinct and recent by the closest affinities and would give the filiation and origin of each tongue in confirmation of this view let us glance at the classification of varieties which are known or believed to be descended from a single species these are grouped under the species with the sub-varieties under the varieties and in some cases as with the domestic pigeon with several other grades of difference nearly the same rules are followed as in classifying species authors have insisted on the necessity of arranging varieties on a natural instead of an artificial system we are cautioned for instance not to class two varieties of the pineapple together merely because their fruit though the most important part happens to be nearly identical no one puts the swedish and common turnips together though the esculent and thickened stems are so familiar whatever part is found to be most constant is used in classing varieties thus the great agriculturist marshall says the horns are very useful for this purpose with cattle because they are less variable than the shape or color of the body etc whereas with sheep the horns are much less serviceable because less constant in classing varieties i apprehend that if we had a real pedigree a genealogical classification would be universally preferred and it has been attempted in some cases for we might feel sure whether there had been more or less modification that the principle of inheritance would keep the forms together which were allied in the greatest number of points in tumbler pigeons though some of the sub-varieties differ in the most important character of the length of the beak yet all are kept together from having the common habit of tumbling but the short-faced breed has nearly or quite lost this habit nevertheless without any thought on the subject these tumblers are kept in the same group because allied in blood and alike in some other respects with species in a state of nature every naturalist has in fact brought descent into his classification for he includes in his lowest grade that of species the two sexes and how enormously these sometimes differ in the most important characters is known to every naturalist scarcely a single fact can be predicated in common of the adult males and hermaphrodites of certain cirripedes and yet no one dreams of separating them as soon as the three orchidean forms monacanthus myanthus and catacetum which had previously been ranked as three distinct genera were known to be sometimes produced on the same plant they were immediately considered as varieties and now i have been able to show that they are the male female and hermaphrodite forms of the same species the naturalist includes as one species the various larval stages of the same individual however much they may differ from each other and from the adult as well as the so-called alternate generations of steenstrup which can only in a technical sense be considered as the same individual he includes monsters and varieties not from their partial resemblance to the parent form but because they are descended from it 
as descent has universally been used as classing together the individuals of the same species though the males and females and larvae are sometimes extremely different and as it has been used in classing varieties which have undergone a certain and sometimes a considerable amount of modification may not the same element of descent have been unconsciously used in grouping species under genera and genera under higher groups all under the so-called natural system i believe it has been unconsciously used and thus only can i understand the several rules and guides which have been followed by our best systematists as we have no written pedigrees we are forced to trace community of descent by resemblances of any kind therefore we choose those characters which are the least likely to have been modified in relation to the conditions of life to which each species has been recently exposed rudimentary structures on this view are as good as or even sometimes better than other parts of the organization we care not how trifling a character may be let it be the mere inflection of the angle of the jaw the manner in which an insect's wing is folded whether the skin be covered by hair or feathers if it prevail throughout many and different species especially those having very different habits of life it assumes high value for we can account for its presence in so many forms with such different habits only by inheritance from a common parent we may err in this respect in regard to single points of structure but when several characters less of them be ever so trifling concur throughout a large group of beings having different habits we may feel almost sure on the theory of descent that these characters have been inherited from a common ancestor and we know that such aggregated characters have a special value in classification we can understand why a species or a group of species may depart from its allies in several of its most important characteristics and yet be safely classed with them this may be safely done and it is often done as long as a sufficient number of characters let them be ever so unimportant betrays the hidden bond of community of descent let two forms have not a single character in common yet if these extreme forms are connected together by a chain of intermediate groups we may at once infer their community of descent and we put them all into the same class as we find organs of high physiological importance those which serve to preserve life under the most diverse conditions of existence are generally the most constant we attach a special value to them but if the same organs in another group or section of group are found to differ much we at once value them less in our classification we shall presently see why embryological characters are of such high classificatory importance geographical distribution may sometimes be brought usefully into play in classing large genera because all the species of the same genus inhabiting any distinct and isolated region are in all probability descended from the same parents analogical resemblances we can understand on the above views the very important distinction between real affinities and analogical or adaptive resemblances lamarck first called attention to this subject and he has been ably followed by maclay and others the resemblance in the shape of the body and in the fin-like anterior limbs between dugongs and whales and between these two orders of mammals and fishes are analogical so is the resemblance between a mouse and a shrew mouse sorex which belong to different orders and the still closer resemblance insisted on by mr myvart between the mouse and a small marsupial animal antichinus of australia these latter resemblances may be accounted for as it seems to me by adaptation for similarly active movements through thickets and herbage together with concealment from enemies among insects there are innumerable instances thus linnaeus misled by external appearances actually classed an homopterous insect as a moth we see something of the same kind even with our domestic varieties as in the strikingly similar shape of the body in the approved breeds of the chinese and common pig which are descended from distinct species and in the similarly thickened stems of the common 
and specifically distinct Swedish turnip. The resemblance between the greyhound and race-horse is hardly more fanciful than the analogies which have been drawn by some authors between widely different animals. On the view of characters being of real importance for classification, only in so far as they reveal descent, we can clearly understand why analogical or adaptive characters, although of the utmost importance to the welfare of the being, are almost valueless to the systematist. For animals, belonging to two most distinct lines of descent, may have become adapted to similar conditions, and thus have assumed a close external resemblance, but such resemblances will not reveal, will rather tend to conceal their blood relationship. We can thus also understand the apparent paradox that the very same characters are analogical when one group is compared with another, but give true affinities when the members of the same group are compared together. Thus, the shape of the body and fin-like limbs are only analogical when whales are compared with fishes, being adaptations in both classes or swimming through the water, but between the several members of the whale family, the shape of the body and the fin-like limbs offer characters exhibiting true affinity, for as these parts are so nearly similar throughout the whole family, we cannot doubt that they have been inherited from a common ancestor. So it is with fishes. Numerous cases could be given of striking resemblances in quite distinct beings between single parts or organs which have been adapted for the same functions. A good instance is afforded by the close resemblance of the jaws of the dog and Tasmanian wolf, or by Lassinus, animals which are widely sundered in the natural system. But this resemblance is confined to general appearance, as in the prominence of the canines and in the cutting shape of the molar teeth for the teeth really differ much. Thus the dog has on each side of the upper jaw four premolars and only two molars, while the thylacinus has three premolars and four molars. The molars also differ much in the two animals in relative size and structure. The adult dentition is preceded by a widely different milk dentition. Any one may, of course, deny that the teeth in either case have been adapted for tearing flesh, through the natural selection of successive variations. But if this be admitted, in the one case, it is unintelligible to me that it should be denied in the other. I am glad to find that so high an authority as Professor Flower has come to this same conclusion. The extraordinary case is given in a former chapter of widely different fishes possessing electric organs, of widely different insects possessing luminous organs, and of orchids and aslepiads, having pollen masses with viscid discs, come under this same head of analogical resemblances. But these cases are so wonderful that they were introduced as difficulties or objections to our theory. In all such cases, some fundamental difference in the growth or development of the parts, and generally in their matured structure, can be detected. The end gained is the same, but the means, though appearing superficially to be the same, are essentially different. The principle formerly alluded to under the term of analogical variation has probably, in these cases, often come into play, that is, the members of the same class, although only distantly allied, have inherited so much in common in their constitution that they are apt to vary under similar exciting causes in a similar manner and this would obviously aid in the acquirement, through natural selection, of parts or organs strikingly like each other, independently of their direct inheritance from a common progenitor. As species belonging to distinct classes have often been adapted by successive slight modifications to live under nearly similar circumstances, to inhabit, for instance, the three elements of land, air, and water, we can perhaps understand how it is that a numerical parallelism has sometimes been observed between the subgroups of distinct classes. A naturalist, struck with a parallelism of this nature, by arbitrarily raising or sinking the value of the groups in several classes, and all our experience shows that their valuation is as yet arbitrary, could easily extend the parallelism over a wide range and thus the septenary, quinary, quaternary, 
and ternary classifications have probably arisen there is another and curious class of cases in which close external resemblance does not depend on adaptation to similar habits of life but has been gained for the sake of protection i allude to the wonderful manner in which certain butterflies imitate as first described by mr bates other and quite distinct species this excellent observer has shown that in some districts of south america where for instance an ithomia abounds in gaudy swarms another butterfly namely a leptalis is often found mingled in the same flock and the latter so closely resembles the ithomia in every shade and stripe of colour and even in the shape of its wings that mr bates with his eyes sharpened by collecting during eleven years was though always on his guard continually deceived when the mockers and the mocked are caught and compared they are found to be very different in essential structure and to belong not only to distinct genera but often to distinct families had this mimicry occurred in only one or two instances it might have been passed over as a strange coincidence but if we proceed from a district where one leptalis imitates an ithomia another mocking and mocked species belonging to the same two genera equally close in their resemblance may be found altogether no less than ten genera are enumerated which include species that imitate other butterflies the mockers and mocked always inhabit the same region we never find an imitator living remote from the form which it imitates the mockers are almost invariably rare insects the mocked in almost every case abounds in swarms in the same district in which a species of leptalis closely imitates an ithomia there are sometimes other lepidoptera mimicking the same ithomia so that in the same place species of three genera of butterflies and even a moth are found all closely resembling a butterfly belonging to a fourth genus it deserves especial notice that many of the mimicking forms of the leptalis as well as of the mimicked forms can be shown by a graduated series to be merely varieties of the same species while others are undoubtedly distinct species but why it may be asked are certain forms treated as the mimicked and others as the mimickers mr bates satisfactorily answers this question by showing that the form which is imitated keeps the usual dress of the group to which it belongs while the counterfeiters have changed their dress and do not resemble their nearest allies we are next led to inquire what reason can be assigned for certain butterflies and moths so often assuming the dress of another and quite distinct form why to the perplexity of naturalists has nature condescended to the tricks of the stage mr bates has no doubt hit on the true explanation the mocked forms which always abound in numbers must habitually escape destruction to a large extent otherwise they could not exist in such swarms and a large amount of evidence has now been collected showing that they are distasteful to birds and other insect devouring animals the mocking forms on the other hand that inhabit the same district are comparatively rare and belong to rare groups hence they must suffer habitually from some danger for otherwise from the number of eggs laid by all butterflies they would in three or four generations swarm over the whole country now if a member of one of these persecuted and rare groups were to assume a dress so like that of a well-protected species that it continually deceived the practiced eyes of an entomologist it would often deceive predaceous birds and insects and thus often escape destruction mr bates may almost be said to have actually witnessed the process by which the mimickers have come so closely to resemble the mimicked for he found that some of the forms of leptalis which mimic so many other butterflies varied in an extreme degree in one district several varieties occurred and of these one alone resembled to a certain extent the common ithomia of the same district in another district there were two or three varieties one of which was much commoner than the others and this closely mocked another form of ithomia from facts of this nature mr bates concludes 
that the leptalist first varies and when a variety happens to resemble in some degree any common butterfly inhabiting the same district this variety from its resemblance to a flourishing and little persecuted kind has a better chance of escaping destruction from predaceous birds and insects and is consequently oftener preserved Quote, the less perfect degrees of resemblance being generation after generation eliminated and only the others left to propagate their kind End quote. so that here we have an excellent illustration of natural selection messrs wallace and tryman have likewise described several equally striking cases of imitation in the lepidoptera of the malay archipelago and africa and with some other insects mr wallace has also detected one such case with birds but we have none with the larger quadrupeds a much greater frequency of imitation with insects than with other animals is probably the consequence of their small size insects cannot defend themselves except indeed the kinds furnished with a sting and i have never heard of an instance of such kinds mocking other insects though they are mocked insects cannot easily escape by flight from the larger animals which prey on them therefore speaking metaphorically they are reduced like most weak creatures to trickery and dissimulation it should be observed that the process of imitation probably never commenced between forms widely dissimilar in colour but starting with species already somewhat like each other the closest resemblance if beneficial could readily be gained by the above means and if the imitated form was subsequently and gradually modified through any agency the imitating form would be led along the same track and thus be altered to almost any extent so that it might ultimately assume an appearance or colouring wholly unlike that of the other members of the family to which it belonged there is however some difficulty on this head for it is necessary to suppose in some cases that ancient members belonging to several distinct groups before they had diverged to their present extent accidentally resembled a member of another and protected group in a sufficient degree to afford some slight protection this having given the basis for the subsequent acquisition of the most perfect resemblance on the nature of the affinities connecting organic beings as the modified descendants of dominant species belonging to the larger genera tend to inherit the advantages which made the groups to which they belong large and their parents dominant they are almost sure to spread widely and to seize on more and more places in the economy of nature the larger and more dominant groups within each class thus tend to go on increasing in size and they consequently supplant many smaller and feebler groups thus we can account for the fact that all organisms recent and extinct are included under a few great orders and under still fewer classes as showing how few the higher groups are in number and how widely they are spread throughout the world the fact is striking that the discovery of australia has not added an insect belonging to a new class and that in the vegetable kingdom as showing how few the higher groups are in number and how widely they are spread throughout the world the fact is striking that the discovery of australia has not added an insect belonging to a new class and that in the vegetable kingdom as i learn from dr hooker it has added only two or three families of small size in the chapter on geological succession i attempted to show on the principle of each group having generally diverged much in character during the long continued process of modification how it is that the more ancient forms of life often present characters in some degree intermediate between existing groups as some few of the old and intermediate forms having transmitted to the present day descendants but a little modified these constitute our so-called osculant or aberrant groups the more aberrant any form is the greater must be the number of connecting forms which have been exterminated and utterly lost and we have evidence of aberrant groups having suffered severely from extinction for they are almost always represented by extremely few species and such species as do occur are generally very distinct from each other 
which again implies extinction the genera ornithorhynchus and lepidosiren for example would not have been less aberrant had each been represented by a dozen species instead of as at present by a single one or by two or three we can i think account for this fact only by looking at aberrant groups as forms which have been conquered by more successive competitors with a few members still preserved under unusually favourable conditions mr waterhouse has remarked that when a member belonging to one group of animals exhibits an affinity to a quite distinct group this affinity in most cases is general and not special thus according to mr waterhouse of all rodents the bizcacha is most nearly related to marsupials but in the points in which it approaches this order its relations are general that is not to any one marsupial species more than to another as these points of affinity are believed to be real and not merely adaptive they must be due in accordance with our view to inheritance from a common progenitor therefore we must suppose either that all rodents including the bizcacha branched off from some ancient marsupial which will naturally have been more or less intermediate in character with respect to all existing marsupials or that both rodents and marsupials branched off from a common progenitor and that both groups have since undergone much modification in divergent directions on either view we must suppose that the bizcacha has retained by inheritance more of the character of its ancient progenitor than have other rodents and therefore it will not be specially related to any one existing marsupial but indirectly to all or nearly all marsupials from having partially retained the character of their common progenitor or of some early member of the group on the other hand of all marsupials as mr waterhouse has remarked the phascolomys resembles most nearly not any one species but the general order of rodents in this case however it may be strongly suspected that the resemblance is only analogical owing to the fast colonies having become adapted to habits like those of a rodent the elder de candol has made nearly similar observations on the general nature of the affinities of distinct families of plants on the principle of the multiplication and gradual divergence in character of the species descended from a common progenitor together with their retention by inheritance of some characters in common we can understand the excessively complex and radiating affinities by which all the members of the same family or higher group are connected together for the common progenitor of a whole family now broken up by extinction into distinct groups and sub-groups will have transmitted some of its characters modified in various ways and degrees to all the species and they will consequently be related to each other by circuitous lines of affinity of various lengths as may be seen in the diagram so often referred to mounting up through many predecessors as it is difficult to show the blood relationship between the numerous kindred of any ancient and noble family even by the aid of a genealogical tree and almost impossible to do so without this aid we can understand the extraordinary difficulty which naturalists have experienced in describing without the aid of a diagram the various affinities which they perceive between the many living and extinct members of the same great natural class extinction as we have seen in the fourth chapter has played an important part in defining and widening the intervals between the several groups in each class we may thus account for the distinctness of whole classes from each other for instance of birds from all other vertebrate animals by the belief that many ancient forms of life have been utterly lost through which the early progenitors of birds were formerly connected with the early progenitors of the other and at that time less differentiated vertebrate classes there has been much less extinction of the forms of life which once connected fishes with batrachians there has been still less within some whole classes for instance the crustacea for here the most wonderfully diverse forms are still linked together by a long and only partially broken chain of affinities extinction has only defined the groups it has by no means made them 
for if every form which has ever lived on earth were suddenly to reappear though it would be quite impossible to give definitions by which each group could be distinguished still a natural classification or at least a natural arrangement would be possible we shall see this by turning to the diagram the letters a to l may represent eleven silurian genera some of which have produced large groups of modified descendants with every link in a branch and sub-branch still alive and the links not greater than those between existing varieties in this case it would be quite impossible to give definitions by which the several members of the several groups could be distinguished from their more immediate parents and descendants yet the arrangement in the diagram would still hold good and would be natural for on the principle of inheritance all the forms descended for instance from a would have something in common in a tree we can distinguish this or that branch though at the actual fork the two unite and blend together we could not as i have said define the several groups but we could pick out types or forms representing most of the characters of each group whether large or small and thus give a general idea of the value of the differences between them this is what we should be driven to if we were ever to succeed in collecting all the forms in any one class which have lived throughout all time and space assuredly we shall never succeed in making so perfect a collection nevertheless in certain classes we are tending toward this end and milne edwards has lately insisted in an able paper on the high importance of looking to types whether or not we can separate and define the groups to which types belong finally we have seen that natural selection which follows from the struggle for existence and which almost inevitably leads to extinction and divergence of character in the descendants from any one parent species explains that great and universal feature in the affinities of all organic beings namely their subordination in group under group we use the element of descent in classing the individuals of both sexes and of all ages under one species although they may have but few characters in common we use descent in classing acknowledged varieties however different they may be from their parents and i believe that this element of descent is the hidden bond of connection which naturalists have sought under the term of the natural system on this idea of the natural system being in so far as it has been perfected genealogical in its arrangement with the grades of difference expressed by the terms genera families orders etc we can understand why we value certain resemblances far more than others why we use rudimentary and useless organs or others of trifling physiological importance why in finding the relations between one group and another we summarily reject analogical or adaptive characters and yet use these same characters within the limits of the same group we can clearly see how it is that all living and extinct forms can be grouped together within a few great classes and how the several members of each class are connected together by the most complex and radiating lines of affinities we shall never probably disentangle the inextricable web of the affinities between the members of any one class but when we have a distinct object in view and do not look to some unknown plan of creation we may hope to make sure but slow progress professor haeckel in his general morphologie and in another works has recently brought his great knowledge and abilities to bear on what he calls phylogeny or the lines of descent of all organic beings in drawing up the several series he trusts chiefly to embryological characters but receives aid from homologous and rudimentary organs as well as from the successive periods at which the various forms of life are believed to have first appeared in our geological formations he has thus boldly made a great beginning and shows us how classification will in the future be treated End of chapter fourteen part one